Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear fellow redeemed, our uh, reflection tonight is based on Matthew chapter 2. Tonight is the last time that we will be able to enjoy these festive Christmas decorations together for another year. Uh, the twelfth day of Christmas actually was yesterday, and uh, today is Epiphany, and the start of something new. The season of Epiphany begins on January 6th and goes until Ash Wednesday, or the beginning of Lent, which is in early March this year. Now take a moment and uh, look at the uh, nativity scene. I don't know, did we, did we find that we didn't get the wise men out? <laughs> we intentionally put the wise men away so we wouldn't get them out until tonight, and then we forgot. So, the, so use your imagination, um, and uh, that's all right. That's just like how it happens at home, right, Julie? It's pretty much the same thing. Um, the uh, nativity scene, we, you know, we've got the familiar figures there, Mary and Joseph and the Holy Family and the wise men usually. And uh, most of, of you probably have nativity scenes that you set up at your home. Uh, uh, I've seen some very elaborate, some very beautiful, expensive ones that people have. Those are gorgeous. Some that are handmade uh, and all, all sorts of different things. When uh, I was a pastor, I don't think I've told this story maybe more than to just a couple of you, so I hope that I'm not tiring you with this in case I have repeated it. But when I was a pastor in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we did something. Uh, one of our members actually had this uh, idea. I don't know where she, where she saw it somewhere, I suppose. Where we did a live nativity every year. Um, our church property was on a, on a busy road. And we built just this very simple little structure to represent a stable. And members of the congregation would dress up as Mary and Joseph and uh, the shepherds. We didn't use a real live baby because it was usually pretty cold, so we had a doll. And, and uh, children could participate by dressing up as shepherds. And, and we cut out uh, wooden uh, shapes in the, in the shapes of barn animals so that they would kind of be, be there and we would throw around hay. And, um, and then we, we had a ladder behind the stable where someone dressed up like an angel and she would stand up there and we were afraid the wind was going to blow her away. And we would show lights and, and just do this scene. No one had any speaking parts. There was no activity. We just kind of were just there. And uh, people would drive by on their way home from work. This, we would do this just actually like the two or three days right before Christmas. And, uh, and people would stop. And one year it was extremely cold. And uh, there was a news crew that was going all over the city of Pittsburgh interviewing people that were outdoors, wondering what kind of crazy people were, you know, some people had to work. And there we were. So they came over and did a little piece on us. And uh, after, you know, doing it a couple years, people began to expect that. It was really kind of a charming ministry, uh, a way of reaching out and showing, reminding people uh, as they're busy driving home and going to shops. Uh, of the true spirit of the season and we would open up the church and people would come inside some of them would stop many would honk at us um, and some would stop and come inside bring their children and one year we had live animals and, and that was a huge attraction for kids and then they would come inside see the church sit down we'd listen to Christmas music had cocoa and cookies and all that sort of thing well in addition to the um, shepherds and whatnot. We had the we had wise men. We had people dressed up uh, as the magi, which is the story for tonight. This is very common to have the magi or the wise men with the nativity scene. But we know a little. We don't know very much historically about these wise men. We don't have lots of information about them. We don't know their names. We don't exactly know where they were from. But we can uh, we can ascertain just a few details about them. And one is. Um, what you, I don't know if you realize this or not, but they most likely were not there at the actual uh, stable where Jesus was born. I, I mean, this, there's absolutely nothing wrong if you put your wise men out. That's, that, that's a very uh, endearing custom. But, but historically and, and biblically, they probably came later. It's how it seems to read, that they came a little bit later on. And as you know, if you notice, in Matthew's Gospel, there was the piece where it says, they went to the house where Mary and Jesus were staying. And of course, the stable and a house are two different things entirely. So they must have stayed around for a while. And uh, we don't know um, if there were three of them. We usually I d portray three because there are three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But there may have been 10 or 4 or 20 or something like that. And we don't know what country they were from. Um, we, they, all the scripture says they were from the east. 
And Babylon is usually a pretty good guess because the Babylonians were very noted, ancient Babylonians were noted for their astronomy and astrology. They, they were stargazers and, um, and also Israel was um, captive in Babylon for a period so there would have been a lot of overlapping cultural connection there. So we don't really know. What we do know is they weren't Israelites. Okay? That's the interesting, that's the important point for you to note is that they were not Jewish people, most likely. They were magi from the east, they were wise men from the east. The word magi is uh, just an old, old word that means um, someone with wisdom. It's actually, we get the word magistrate from that, uh, and, and, and magician too. To, so it can mean all sorts of philosopher, scientist, it means the educated class. Now I, I read a comedian who said that, um, that the reason the wise men were late is because they were men. This article said that uh, it would have been a totally different scene had it been wise women instead of men. If they'd been wise women, for instance, they would have asked directions, okay, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, brought more practical gifts, and uh, there would be peace on earth today. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know what you think of that. The Bible doesn't tell us um, that much about them. There is this text in Numbers chapter 24 that says, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. So they may have been familiar with the Hebrew prophecies that a star and a king would someday be uh, coming out of Israel. And the word that's used there, another little tidbit for you, uh, for star, people kind of look, so, well, what was that? Uh, there's no star that does this kind of thing, and um, the we, the word mean the word is aster, from which we get a astronomy and, and asteroid, and it doesn't literally mean star in the scientific sense that we would think of as a a, a, a burning ball of gas. It just simply means any sort of phenomena, any cosmological phenomena. So it could have been a planet, a nova, a comet, or of course it could refer to a, an entirely unique event, a miraculous event created by God for this purpose alone. Now, back in those days in the ancient world, it was very common for nations to have their own national gods. The Assyrians had their gods. The Romans had their gods, the Canaanites had theirs, and the Israelites, well, they had their solo god. And sometimes the ancient nations would uh, duke it out to try to see whose god had preeminence, and, they, uh, and the conquered nation would often have to adopt the worship of the conquerors. And to acknowledge a local deity was seen as an act of patriotism as much as an act of piety. And that's just the way it was. That was the state of things uh, in the ancient world, at least outside of Israel, and, and most people um, were content with that. The idea that there was only one true God, one universal God, not just the God over Israel, but the God over all the nations of the earth, and that all other gods, all other competing deities were false and fictional, this idea would have been seen as arrogant and imperialistic. And that is exactly um, what the scripture teach, Hebrew scriptures teach, though, in Psalm 72. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. On the night of his birth, Jesus was adored by the shepherds, and they were Jews. And Jesus is the king of the Jews. But the wise men, the wise men were Gentiles. And a Gentile, as you know by definition, is any non-Jew. And it makes sense by the ancient world standards that the Jewish shepherds would worship Jesus in a way, but the fact that these Gentile wise men came from one land to another and also bowed their knees. Did you notice that it said in Matthew, they didn't just come and bring gifts to Jesus. It says they worshipped him. They worshipped him. They recognized that this was no mere baby, no mere human king, but a deity in the flesh. And it says that the, um, the, the fact that these Gentile wise men bowed their knees to worship the baby Jesus means 
that he is not just a national God, he is not just the king of the Jews, he is the king of kings, 